So, number one. Uh, a mutual electrical attraction between nuclei and valence electrons of a different atom that binds the atoms together below. It's a chemical bond. It's a, this is a really fancy way of saying a chemical bond, okay? I mean, it, it, I know that that seems like, oh, why can't we just keep it simple? But the key here is the saying, it holds atoms together. Since it's saying it holds atoms together and not molecules together, it's a it's a chemical bond. It's not like an intermolecular force, like a lo or a, a hydrogen bond or a dipole dipole bond or something. Molecules, it would be an intermolecular force. Now, and I'm going to go through these kind of quick since we're doing all of them. Uh, if two covalently bonded atoms are identical, the bond is nonpolar covalent. So, I mean, that if it's just identical, an example would be like you know O bonded to O. You know, everything's the same. It's obviously not a polar molecule, but it's still a covalent bond. That's why it's nonpolar covalent. Good? Okay. Uh, if the atoms that share electrons have an unequal attraction for the electrons, the bond is called polar. That's a really fancy way of saying, of saying unequal sharing. You should see the term unequal. Okay, unequal and sharing. Covalent bonds that are shared unequally are polar. That's the whole point. Does that make sense? Yes, good. Now, four probably does require a bit of explanation. What they want you to do is first determine, you know, what's going to have a partial negative charge. That means you've got to figure out what's polar. So we've already drawn O2, HCl looks like this, F2 looks like this. What is the only molecule here that's not polar? Or, or pardon me, that is polar. HCl. This is the only polar one. Now, if you look at your little, you know, electronegativity chart, H has a value of 2.1. Chlorine has a value, it's across, it's 3.16. Which one's bigger, obviously? Chlorine is more electronegative. So chlorine would have the partial negative charge, and hydrogen would have the partial positive charge. The rest of these, they don't even have them because they're not polar. They don't have partial positives and partial negatives. So... That tells you right away, then, the answer is obviously chlorine. Five, the octet rule. Uh, and am I going at a reasonable speed here for you guys? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Five, yeah, I've talked about it. I mean, I've never made you write a note down on it, but I've mentioned it many times. Octet meaning eight electrons. Everything wants to have eight electrons. Think about it like octagon. Eight sides, octet, same deal. Uh, and that would be the noble gases. They have eight valence electrons. Drawing a Lewis structure, each non-metal atom except hydrogen should be surrounded by, I mean, eight electrons. I don't have a lot to say on that one. You should, you should know that. Uh, after drawing a Lewis structure, number seven's kind of, yeah, it's debatable. I mean, the answer is C because you just want to basically confirm that you have the correct number of valence electrons used up. That's not really a test question. That's more of a process question, like how do you do it? Uh, now, eight, the substance whose Lewis structure shows three covalent bonds is now there's two ways you can do this you can draw out every Lewis structure and actually count the bonds or you can just look and say which is the only structure that's going to form three bonds and you look that's gonna have four bonds right that's going to have four bonds that's going to have how many bonds two, two. so the only one that's even going to have three bonds is NH3 uh, so some of these questions are a lot simpler than you might think. You say, oh, how many covalent bonds? Let's just, just look at the subscripts and see how many bonds it forms. Uh, you keep going. A chemical formula for a molecular compound represents the composition of a, a molecule. That's, a, that, that's kind of a weird that's question. Nine. Did I skip nine? Yeah. I, I apologize. Well, let's do ten, then we'll do nine. First, for ten, was that a weird question to a lot of you? I mean, so I, I, it, the way it's worded, it's a poor question, so I wouldn't worry about it. I just wanted to put it on there for you. Uh, but, I mean, the chemical formula for a molecular compound represents the composition of a molecule. It's just saying, you know, the formula for C, you know, CH4, that's the chemical composition of it. That's a molecule. For 9, OH, the Lewis structure for OH. You know, you've got O. I mean, that's it. How many electrons can we see? Eight. Now, obviously, some of you are going to be like, I want to say six, but six is not an option because they, they're talking total electrons, so the, op the only option is eight. All right. Now, down here, 11, 12, how, how did you do with the formulas? Okay, so, so you need a bit of a refresher on that. Okay. 
Uh, 11. We've got lead 2 and chromate. So it tells you you've got Pb plus 2. Remember that the Roman numeral indicates the charge, and it's always positive. And then chromate, did you actually look chromate up on your ion chart? You hopefully did, and you see chromate is CrO4, negative 2. So if that's our structure, or that's our formula, we need to write that formula out. Are those charges going to neutralize each other immediately? Yes, yes they are. So all you need to do is Pb, Cr, O4. No parentheses, no anything, because plus 2, negative 2, you're good. You don't How about if, like, it was negative 3 plus 2, you switch on? Then you got to switch them, yeah. Well, if it's covalent, you Covalence, the prefixes, there is no charges at all, okay? So in this case, that's the answer, but then let's look at 12, which does entail uh, that. So 12, what is the formula for aluminum sulfate? Aluminum is plus 3, sulfate is negative 2. So this is a, this right here is ionic. Yes, it's an ionic bond. In this case, you could just switch the charges and write Al2SO4 in parentheses 3. Does that make sense? Great. Good. All right. Other side, we're almost done. You're being good. More of the same. Uh, in this case, though, you're writing out formulas. Now, name the, or you're writing out names. So name the compound. How did we do on 13? Kind of, okay. Yeah. So for 13, you've got nickel 2 chlorate. The reason it's nickel 2, first you look up ClO3. How many of those do you have? One, two. It says you have two of them. So you've got two ClO3s, just to sort of show you here. Now, actually, before we do anything, the, the name is simple enough. It's nickel. You know that Ni is nickel, right? And you know that ClO3 is chlorate. But the key question you have to ask yourself, nickel falls right there. That is in this specific group, which we call what? It's a transition metal, yes. So nickel needs to have a... Roman numeral indicating its ionic charge. So to do that, you have to figure out what the charge on nickel is. Now you have two ClO3s. You have one nickel. The charge on ClO3 on chlorate is what? Negative one. So if we have negative one, we have two of those. The total charge is obviously negative two. So what must the charge on the one nickel be to cancel it out? It's got to be plus two. That's the only potential option. That's why it's nickel two chlorate. And it's chlorate, not chlorite. Not chloride. Potassium chlorate. Potassium is not a transition metal, so you just write potassium chlorate out and that's it. Done. Compound, silicon uh, dioxide. This is a covalent compound, correct? Notice that it's a covalent compound. It's non-metal to non-metal, so you use the prefixes silicon dioxide. And you don't use monosilicon monodioxide because you don't write it for the first one. Same thing with 16. Did, were we good for 15 and 16? Yeah. Good. I'm assuming 17 was no issue either. It's just, you know, diphosphorus pentaoxide. Formula for hydrogen chloride. Again, you shouldn't have had a problem doing that. If it was ionic, yeah, but it, it's not, so you don't worry about it. 19. 19 was a very basic thing, and you should remember this, by the way. This is one thing I'm not giving you on the test. I mean, you can look it up on your ion chart, but remember that the first column is plus 1, plus 2. Do we remember this? Plus 3, and then we go minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. That's key to remember that. Uh, so we do that. What is the ionic charge of hydrogen uh, in O2 or in, or in H2O? Plus one. Uh, even though it is a covalent compound, it's, it's kind of a tricky one. Don't worry about that one. Then the last ones is the stuff we just did. 21. Wow, that's really zoomed in, isn't it? So which of the intermolecular forces discussed has the strongest attractive force? 
Now, these two questions, did these throw you guys off at all? Or were we successful for the most part? Okay, now see, here's the thing. This just says which is, the, which is the following is the strongest bond. The one above it says which of the following intermolecular forces. 21, the answer is hydrogen bonding because hydrogen bonding is the strongest intermolecular force. 22, which of the following is the strongest bond in general given to you is covalent bonding. Because remember, intramolecular is stronger than the intermoleculars. Yeah. I won't, I won't make you distinguish. I just want you to understand those are in the same category, you know. 23, what type of bonding occurs between a cation? I mean, that's ionic bonding. 24, which of the following molecules is likely to show hydrogen bonding? Uh, that's a pretty obvious one, right? The key is, though, you recognize H bonded to one of those three elements. And then 25, uh, which of the following is the main form of, I mean, hydrogen bonding? I mean, are there any questions? Was that actually a pretty good explanation? Yeah, it's like, it's like the test that I